Okay. Okay, everybody. Good morning. So excited to have all of you here in the final day of shift. For you guys, it's been five days. For some of us, it's been like a month and a half. So we're really happy to be here for the end of shift. It's just been quite a marathon, but we're so excited to have some of you here. Uh, we broke the 20 people participant mark, Matt. So you drew a crowd on Friday morning. We are good to go. Uh, housekeeping notes, we are recording these sessions. So please make sure that you, um, if you don't wanna be recorded, please uh, turn off your video. And if you do have your video online, but have no pants or underwear, please don't send up. That's not what we wanna be seeing today. Uh, for those of you that require a little bit of assistance in understanding uh, the English language, uh, we do have live, live transcription on uh, in the session. All you gotta do is set it up in your Zoom accounts and it works perfectly. So without further ado, I'm gonna leave you with Victor Davila who's gonna set it, up, set it up for today, this morning. Good morning, everyone. So happy to see you here. Um, in a couple of the past uh, sessions, I might've mentioned having colleagues that would um, support you and um, kind of like set you up for success. And I, I'm thrilled to int introduce my friend, Matt Dombrowski, who does just that for me as a colleague of mine at the University of Central Florida. Um, Matt serves as the area coordinator for experimental animation in the department. Uh, he's also an affiliate faculty, as am I, for Limitless Solution, a nonprofit organization within the, uh, the University of Central Florida, where he serves as our creative director, promoting Limitless Solutions' mission of accessibility and leads an interdisciplinary team in developing 3D printed visually expressive bionic arms and training video games for children, veterans, and first responders with limb differences to utilize their prospects. Uh, the prosthetics properly. I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce you to you this morning, my friend, Matt Dabrowski. Thank you, Victor. I, you know, I can't do anything without Victor. That's the, like, he is, he's amazing. I think we can all, if you guys don't know Victor or follow Victor, follow him. He is the kindest human on the planet. Um, highest of all esteem. There's a bromance for 20 years going on between us. Uh, Let's go for at least 20 more years to come. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. I was so excited to be here, speaking of Victor, that I think I posted three times that this presentation was tomorrow, and it was like four days out. Like every day, I was like, tomorrow's the day, and it was like Wednesday, you know, and Victor would comment, say, hey, by tomorrow, he means Friday. So I'm really excited to be here and really uh, excited to kind of talk about our mission at Limitless and more importantly, kind of draw some parallels to what we do as design educators and how we can use design and creativity to create amazing, impactful projects and inspire and empower others. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at Limitless, a little bit about how I got involved as a former industry designer, professor turned creative director, and then give you hopefully a ton of tips and tricks that you can bring back to your classroom to help you all um, kind of empower our students and empower the underserved. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I, I, I don't know about you, every time I share my screen, I have to announce it apparently, like it's been two years, but uh, we'll hop in. Let me know if you can see that. Um, this is a pretty casual conversation as well. So if there is, uh, I can't see my chat right now, but if there is uh, anyone who wishes to ask a question, uh, feel free. We have some great moderators out there that, um, you know, we can, they can kind of interrupt me and I, I, I'll be okay with that. But uh, so starting off, I am an associate professor, as Victor said, at the University of Central Florida. Uh, I've been there for roughly about 15 years. And before that, I worked in industry as a motion uh, graphics designer, as well as a, a slew of other things when it came to like 3D and, and whatnot. Um, during that 15 years, I've been very privileged to work with amazing faculty members such as Victor and Orlando, and he can attest to this, has an amazing design community. And I, you know, that has kind of really empowered me to kind of go into teaching and, and really kind of uh, build that Orlando community as we go. Um, I'm also an Adobe education leader and Adobe partner by design, which is just a fancy way of saying an educator who uses Adobe who's trying to make a difference into the world. So 
I work with a company called Limitless Solutions. At Limitless, as you can see in the pictures here, we do some pretty cool things. We actually create 3D printed bionic arms for children and give them away free of charge to the families. We're expanding that reach to cover veterans and first responders as well with limb difference. And I'll talk a little bit about today of how the arms work and, and kind of where the idea and the story came from. But kind of taking a step back, before I got into education, I would be in the very commercial world of motion graphics, um, you know, direct marketing uh, design, whether it was for jumbotrons for the NBA or uh, Disney TV shows and intro sequences. It was a fantastic opportunity to work with some amazing companies, but I truly fell in love with teaching. And so when I went to get my graduate degree in the early 2000s, I, um, and that's one of the places I met Victor as well, but I um, absolutely fell in love with being a teacher and inspiring my students. And a few years into that, I was actually approached by uh, a company called Limitless Solutions. Now this company is owned by the University of Central Florida and it started as a student project. And this student project started at a kitchen table. And when they approached me, these undergraduate students were going on to get their master's degree and eventually they would get their doctorates and all sorts of things. But this was about seven years ago. And they were contacted by a parent who was having trouble obtaining a prosthetic limb for their child. Now, for those of you who don't understand the world of prosthetics, prosthetics can be highly, extraordinarily expensive for people who receive them. A typical prosthetic can cost upwards of $50,000 for a family. And if any of you in the audience have children, you know how fast our children grow. My son is two and I've already bought like 15 sets of shoes for him. And he just started walking a couple, like a year ago. So every time the, the kid would outgrow the limb, the family would be forced to pay this exorbitant amount of money and insurance companies typically wouldn't cover that cost. Now, one of the common questions I get just as a quick detour is, uh, do we create legs as well? Well, believe it or not, legs are seen as a necessity and a bionic limb or a prosthetic limb for a child is not seen as a necessity or uh, in the eyes of some insurance companies. So we're trying to change that. Albert Monero, who started this industry uh, or started this kind of project at Limitless was an aerospace engineer who heard a mother on a radio and decided, hey, I can help. And he was not a artist by trade, but he knew that the resources at the university definitely would help um, facilitate this. So the product that they originally made, you can kind of tell which one maybe was designed with the artists coming into the picture in this picture here. <laughs> but the, uh, the uh, arm is uh, 3D printed. It cost us under $500 to create. And the pieces due to 3D printing can actually be modularized, right? So we can like, as the child grows, we can reprint a specific part and help the arm, uh, again, adapt to them as they grow very inexpensively. Actually, again, the families are uh, free or get, get this for free as they go. All right. Matt, Matt one quick question. What's, sure. what's the 3D printing material here? Is it resin, PLA? We use ABS. Uh, we do oh, ABS. in Florida. Okay. So we definitely want to make sure that if anyone puts their bionic in the back seat of the car, it will not turn into a melted mess. Um, so yeah. And I just realized I may have not turned on my audio. So did anyone hear that audio when I played it? No? So I have to do a quick unshare reshare. I apologize. But we'll get to... And Matt, one question for, uh, sure. sorry, some, I, oh, I have no idea about the world of prosthetics. If, if I were to have a kid and they outgrew a prosthetic, would that prosthetic be recycled or, or are these things because they yeah. attach to a body, they get thrown out? So because it's a medical device, we have to be really careful of how we would recycle them. Um, oh, as... I'm, not, I, I'm not talking about yours. I'm talking mm -hmm. about um, in, before you guys came into the sequence, like if kids have a prosthetic that's made and it's a hundred grand prosthetic, does it get recycled or no? Uh, potentially. It, it, it all depends on what material it's made out of. So um, being it's a medical grade device, it, it, you know, it, if any germs or any, you know, we, we don't want to kind of transfer that from, or they don't want to transfer that from one person to another. So typically um, you'll see a lot of prosthetics that aren't very expressive kind of building off of that. So you'll see, that's why you see like hooks or you see um, different kind of non 
uh, maybe all, almost like doll plastic, if some of you have ever seen a prosthetic arm. Uh, it's not it, it's super appealing with that. And so as you know, we continued this mission, and this is kind of right before I got involved with Limitless, um, we found out really quickly that the kids didn't want to have a hook or any sort of device. And, and if you think about it, in contemporary media, we kind of vilify people with prosthetics. Uh, if you think of Captain Hook, right? Or if you think of, there's a movie, The Witches, that got a lot of press recently. Um, people with limb difference are, are often treated as lesser than or not complete or vilified. And so when uh, our bionic kids, as we like so nicely named them, uh, when they would walk around without their prosthetic limb, it typically would be uh, a very scary experience for them, especially for a kid who's maybe under 10 years old. Uh, a lot of our kids would walk behind their parents in grocery stores. And when people would see them, either in our culture, at least in the United States, people were tend to look away, right? We don't want to stare. Or people would ask, what's wrong with you? What happened? Oh my God, are you okay? And that tonality just doesn't help inspire confidence in a young person who's already dealing with a disability. And so when we would gift them with these bionic arms, all of that would change. If, if you're walking around with a bionic arm, people are like, that is amazing. What is that? Show me. And what we would find is with the expressive bionic arms, the non-hooks or doll plastic, our kids would actually lead the way and they would open the door for proactive conversation when it came to limb difference. And so as the development started, Limitless noticed they needed to have more expressive visual artists because this team was originally made up of engineers who were absolutely brilliant, but lacked kind of that visual communication that we all are well aware of that is so important in our, uh, in our times these days. So one of the big moments for us, and we're gonna talk a lot about moments as I go forward, but we kind of got uh, very, very fortunate for a very famous person to give away one of our first big, exciting prosthetic arms. So I'm gonna just play this video. Um, anyone give me a thumbs up if you hear the sound when I hit play, and hopefully there's not an advertisement in it. <laughs> Just gonna go down here. We're looking for nine one two. Hey Alex, how are you? Pleasure to meet you. I have another bionics expert on hand, so I thought I'd drop by. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a pleasure. Nice bow tie, by the way. Thanks. How are your travels? It's very good. Well, I thought I'd bring uh, one of my gauntlets to match it up with yours and uh, see if everything's copacetic. You want to have a look? Sure. Ready? Yep. Great. Each one looks the same. Actually, I think yours might be better than mine. What do you say we, uh, we both try them on, do a progress report? OK. You know who that is? Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Robert. Great. God, dude, it's even cooler than I thought. <clears throat> I'm having a technical glitch. Um, as you can see, my light isn't working. Half the time, you know, I design one of these, it winds up breaking on me. But what I do is I keep working on it, kind of like you're working on it with Albert. He keeps working and working until he gets it right. Yeah. I think yours is still a little bit more right than mine because at least, you know. The lights work. Your light works, yeah. Ah, oh, look at that, Ben. It's a marriage of robotic technologies. Bang, nailed it. Love it. Hey, good job, Albert. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Albert has made it so affordable. I'm probably gonna start farming out a lot of my tech work to Albert too. I feel like he could cut the price point down on one of my suits, which right now is, I guess, about, I don't know, a billion and a half dollars. So this little boy, what, yeah, absolutely, what an awesome opportunity. Uh, Robert was an amazing uh, partner with us there. And he was really excited that um, 
Alex is the little boy's name, actually knew his name was Robert and not Tony. Uh, that was a really big moment. That's that genuine reaction is really, really important because that's why he's like, oh, thank goodness. I don't have to be in character all day. Um, but this was a cool moment to, to see this little boy kind of be inspired and empowered and see others creative reach. Now, as educators, I don't want to let it uh, to kind of leave it unnoticed that this project was solely not related to a class, just a handful of undergraduate students at University of Central Florida with honestly no real teacher mentorship, no, no offense to their teachers at the time, but they just saw the need to do something and they acted. And that's really important. That's what all of us as educators want in our classrooms for people to be able to kind of take what they learn and take that ownership and build what they, they can do outside of that space. So with that came Limitless Solutions. Many PhDs later from some really talented, uh, those undergraduate students are no longer undergraduates, now they're my colleagues, but uh, they created a direct support organization, which is a 501 uh, C3 nonprofit here at UCF. And we continued our mission to empower others through bionic arms. And this moment really was the point where people started to recognize what they were doing. It put it on a national and even international stage. Thank you to Robert for that, where um, people would stop and listen. That's how essentially they came to find me. After this video, they came to ask if, you know, if there was a way that, you know, they can collaborate with art faculty. And typically in a university, that doesn't happen. You don't, which is odd, because we have buildings in sight of each other that have amazing individuals and thinkers. But these, these I call them kids at the time, but came over, sat in a conference room, and I walked in, and I had just seen the video. And I said, oh, it would be really cool to meet them. And we ended up hitting it off, and we ended up realizing that you know we were all creatives and we all had something to bring to that table that kitchen table in a sense where it started to kind of amplify this mission one of the comments i made in that meeting was it would be really cool if that arm could actually be used as a video game controller too and i was thinking of the old power glove by nintendo that some of you may uh remember back in the it was the 80s or 90s and they said absolutely so at that point i <laughs> I kind of stopped and I said, well, I don't really know how to make that. Okay. So I ran to another colleague in game design and I said, Hey, is this something that we can create a video game using this device? And luckily he said, yeah, we can do that. So that's kind of where our team started to become a uh, whole. And nowadays our arms are no longer just a singular Iron Man sleeve. You can actually interchange the different sleeves uh, depending on how you feel that day. So if you want to be Iron Man one day, that's fantastic. But if you want to be Master Chief from the Halo franchise one day, you simply take your sleeve off, all able to do with one hand, and interchange that. The arms work in a, a way where you have stickers on their limb different arm and their muscle group. And depending on how hard they flex, the arm will actually do different gestures, like a point or an okay or a fist. We do have parental controls, by the way, so the kids can't use certain finger gestures uh, though some of them may want to. The ARM mission went from that to taking the same technology and using it on the temporalis muscles to help control wheelchairs for ALS patients. We continue to develop our training video games because if you're going to learn to use a prosthetic, the first time you wear one, you don't want it not to work because especially with a kid, what happens when a kid eats a food that they don't like right away, they don't touch it for a while. So we wanted to make it more palatable for them from the design experience for this. And all of these are really about bringing independence back to our individuals. To us, whether you have ALS or whether you have limb difference or whatever um, accessibility solution we're trying to offer, our goal is to empower our individuals, amplify their voices and serve these communities. And so here's some of our video games um, you can actually down this, uh, download this on iOS or uh, on Android if you have a, a cellular device. Uh, really fun, Limitless Runner. And our kids will actually train with these before they're gifted the arm. So how the gestures work, if you flex 50%, you'll do the, the point. If you flex 80% of your full strength, you may do the open and closed fist. And these games, this character actually jumps depending how high they jump on that basic flex. 
So we're pulling in gamification, visual art, uh, healthcare. You know, we, we reached out to occupational therapists and everyone we could to kind of continue to develop this mission. And it all started with that moment. And that moment really set the, the stage for future moments to begin to occur. Now you can see the power of visual art and how a singular, sometimes in the case of the first two pictures, the same design with different colors chosen by the children can have completely different empowered results. And this is really, again, the impact of graphic design and, and, and the, the visual object. No longer are these vilified. These are now part of our amazing individuals. And these moments continue to happen. We got the opportunity to work with Blue Man Group. Um, Wyatt, who is now going into high of college, actually, um, is on the autism spectrum. He was nonverbal until the age of seven. And Blue Man Group deals with a lot of nonverbal ways of communication. And so it was a perfect fit for them to come together and inspire one another with this prosthetic limb. And so for us, we realized really quickly that, yes, picking things up is really cool, but it's way more than picking things up. It's about empowerment. Design is the ultimate form of communication. We all know that. I'm preaching to my, my crowd here. Not really, because you guys all do this every day in the classroom. But it's really about empowering others. This is Shahali. She was one of the first uh, fashion models to wear a prosthetic limb, one of the ones we made on the New York runway, actually multiple years in a row for Fashion Week. Now. It's interesting because that's a bedazzled arm. That was kind of pre, pre the visual artist as well. So we don't bedazzle things as much anymore. We, though that can be, there's a time and a place. But what we realized was these limits force us to rethink how we are working and they push us to new heights of creativity. And this is, limits are okay. Limits, lim, limits don't make us incomplete. They don't, um, sometimes yes, they are a challenge. But for us as designers, whether we're on the engineer side of design, the game design side of design, or the graphic design side of design, we really came together and found those commonalities with each of our crafts to be able to produce this mission. Our goal has always been, and if you haven't seen Simon Sinek's uh, The Golden Circle TED Talk, please watch it. But it all started with the why. It's odd, but for us, the arm is not why we do it. <laughs> the arm is just the thing we make, right? It's, it's maybe the what, but the why is the moments that we've all witnessed. And I'll share some of those as we go, but the moments of the Iron Man moment was a big why for our university to invest in this kitchen table mission. And so the arm is something we, we're okay if the kid doesn't use, right? We're okay if they only use it when they need it. But the power of design, the power of empowerment and, 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 and inspiring them is important. So much later in my career, I actually read The Power of Moments. If anyone hasn't read this book, it's absolutely amazing. But it talks about different moments in our life that define um, uh, us. And they talk about, uh, for instance, like if, if you're on a, a football, if, if you watch football, the, the players will have a signing day. And somebody once asked, you know, that's really cool for them to declare their school, but why don't we have a signing day for somebody who's going to be a math major or a signing day for somebody who's going to be a science major? Why not stop that empowerment just with athletics? And it, the truth was no one did it. And one school in this book, a high school, started to do that. And they saw that the, these kids skyrocketed in their college careers, which was really, really amazing. Um, now, this was my moment. And this is a very special moment for me. If we take the time machine back a little bit, this is about a year after we've developed the video games. This was my first opportunity to work with one of the kids. We were very closely guarded with our kids. Um, Albert and the team, rightfully so, didn't want to say, hey, this professor guy, come meet all these children. They had, I had to earn their trust. And so this was a moment where we were going to test out urbanic training video games. And this is Zachary. And Zachary has done some amazing things, which I'll talk to you about. But Zachary here, I'm hooking up the Bionic Flex controller for his game. And I was so nervous. I couldn't even touch his limb difference. I, I, he eventually punched me with it and said, come on, dude, let's go. I want to play these games. But at this moment, as soon as he played the video games, this happened. 
Now, remember, I came from a field of motion graphics, 3D design, um, commercialism, for lack of a better way to say it, which is fine, but I never had this type of reaction to a creative project that I worked on. And immediately I was crying. I was in tears. I remember walking back with my research partner, Peter, and saying, this is what we got to do. And we're not doing it to get tenure. We're not doing it to make money. We ha I haven't built Limitless ever since I've worked with them. It was about this moment. And if I can help one child imagine what we can do with the next kid and the kid after that. And this was so amazing. And Zachary, this is a much younger version of Zachary, years later, would go on to create his own comic book illustrated by the amazing Victor Davila. And he, Zachary created a story with his brother Cristo of the Bionic Kid comic where all proceeds will go to getting another child like Zachary a bionic limb. And he said, I wanted to have a pay it forward moment. I received a free bionic and I wanted to do something to show not only that other kids can get bionics for free, but also say, hey, I have limb difference and I'm a superhero. And it doesn't matter what I look like or it doesn't matter how long my arm is for lack of a better way to say it, I am still amazing. And Zachary has gone on to national stages to speak in front of thousands, this is real, thousands of people. He's gone to comic conventions. He's, he even hobnobs with actors <laughs> that like on, on Twitter, like that like help share his mission. And Victor and I definitely got behind this mission because this is why we do it. That one child, and if that was the only child I helped has now touched the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people. So this is why we do what we do. And so another big moment happened where our students at UCF got visited by a pretty the amazing couple. It's amazing in terms couple. of all the things that it can do. This is a nonprofit called Limitless that is doing really amazing stuff using all the latest technology like 3D printing to help kids who need artificial limbs. They're using video games to help train the way you connect your muscles up to the various motors. It's great how much control uh, you're gonna be able to get, uh, but they're gonna keep the cost low and get the control to be even better and better. It's exciting. So it should be lighter than anything you've tried before. Here in the United States, hundreds of thousands of kids are looking for some sort of accessibility tool for their basic day-to-day -day tasks. And unfortunately, less than about a third of them will end up really adapting a prosthetic for daily use. Using 3D printing combined with cutting edge electronics, we have worked to make things lighter, faster, more colorful and artistic while listening to children about what they're looking for, what their needs are, has really helped us transform this technology. We found that kids are able to embrace their new bionic solutions simply because it reflects some of their personality and their expression. Any uh, one of the kids who've gotten a limitless arm, it's good to talk to her about how she uses the control, what the arm lets her do, how over time she's gonna be able to take advantage of that. It's kind of like a Hawaiian-ish kind of deal I was going for, and I just think it's really pretty. I can wear it outside, and a lot of people will stare at me and like, they won't be like, what is that? They'll be like, oh my gosh, it's so pretty kind of thing, or where'd you get it? And where can I get one? I think if you ask the kids, they'd probably tell you it was never about being able to pick things up. It was much more about changing the conversation around them. When you see the kids smile and they realize this is theirs and they're taking it home and it's gonna bring them that level of function and that confidence, that's the moment and that's why we're all working so hard for this mission. So this was a pretty amazing moment, not only for me to be able to meet Bill and Melinda Gates, but this was where I started to kind of connect it back to the classroom. Uh, when this moment happened, we were not told in advance, I was told to wear a suit which usually means I'm in trouble or something's happening. Um, thankfully, something was happening. And I ended up going into the lab and there walks in Bill and Melinda. And just, oh, okay, like we're doing this. And I remember taking a step back and saying, where are my students? And putting my students, Angel specifically, and instead of me demoing that video game, I said, Angel, 
go show Bill and Melinda Gates how this game works that you helped create. And that was that moment for Angel. That was that once in a lifetime moment to go, oh my gosh, yeah, let's do it. And a funny side story, Annika in that video did have to Google who Bill and Melinda Gates was on her way to meet them because she did not know. <laughs> so another amazing moment that happened was this. Now, for most of us, this just looks like a little boy staring at his shadow. But well after that moment, we would meet more and more kids who would receive a limitless arm. And this moment specifically, and I'll replay that, <clears throat> is something where we walked out of the uh, the lab and we found that this little boy staring at his shadow. And this boy, Matthew, had never seen himself with two limbs. And he said, guys, come look, come look, look at my shadow. I'm complete. And that inspired us and also hurt a little bit, right? To feel that this little boy didn't feel like he was complete, though we knew he was, though we knew he was amazing the way he is. But this was his moment. The moment that my intern who captured that video, who had the wherewithal to, to notice that as a, as now he's a film major here at UCF, but to go, I need to take, I need to capture this, um, was well and beyond more impactful than maybe any film he had ever seen because he lived it. It was a way for him to be behind the camera, but also feel the power that film has. So I ask all of you design educators, what is your moment? What have you done in the classroom, not only for you and, and in your careers, but for your students? We as art educators, design educators, have the ability to have these moments happen on a daily basis in our classroom. Uh, we have the ability to connect our students with industry professionals around the world. And it takes minimal effort from us because it just takes asking and it just takes reaching out and saying, hey, would you like to talk to my students? Or connecting a student with a mentor. Um, Victor and the AIGA uh, Orlando chapter do an amazing job with the mentorship program, doing that on a daily basis, connecting our students. So these moments ultimately create empathy. And people ask me all the time, how do you teach empathy? Well, you don't really teach it. Empathy comes from all sorts of different places, but it really starts with that why. And it really is empowered by that moment. So looking at how we start our design process with our students, we start talking about how to design inclusively. And designing inclusively also has parallels to being a really good teacher and creating content in your classroom that is impactful. We have to, as educators, recognize inclusion. We have to solve for each student and then extend that to the group. And we have to learn from each other through our diversity. So whether we're designing a, a solution for accessibility or a impactful project using visual design in our classroom, these elements remain the same. It's also about putting the human back into our designs. Human-centered design is the utmost importance at Limitless, as well as now in my classrooms. I'm no longer teaching my students Photoshop. They can learn buttons. They can go to YouTube and anywhere they want and find a tutorial there. I'm happy to give them those button pushing tutorials, but why are they going to use that product? What are they doing to impact the world? How are they changing their community? And more importantly, how do they use those to amplify their own voices and tell their own stories. So putting the human back into our design uh, talk is so important uh, when it comes to great designs. Now this is from Tim Needles, an amazing individual, which I'll, I'll pitch his book in a bit, but um, the why really have, have, is where creativity, empathy, connection, collaboration, authenticity, and fun come from. If you don't have that why, and if we don't have that why in our classroom, you may see a disconnect from our students. So at Limitless, it was about creating these moments. Sometimes we saw them, sometimes we didn't, but it was about for us as educators to be the microphone. It was not my voice. Limitless is not my voice. Limitless is not Albert Monero's voice. It is the voice of kids like Zachary, Annika, um, and Alex. They are the people we serve. And the idea of service is, is interesting. We don't, you know, it's not work, it's, it's service. And so we listen to them. We observe, we absorb, and then we communicate them to th with them throughout the entire process to assure that we are helping what they need. 
And so listening to others isn't the first time in history that, you know, you can create a really cool invention. And I always remind my students that listening to diverse thinkers and bringing together different mindsets is no different than the printing press. And if we think about Gutenberg discovering how to create a printing press, he basically took a wine press, how he got there, maybe he had a few too many wine, but he created the wine press to basically create a tool that created mass communication throughout history, right? Throughout creating books and being able to get those books out quicker and faster to communities. This is where true innovation occurs. And this is so important for us as educators to not forget that. As we sit in our design class, we have so many different types of thinkers. Um, in higher education, they all may be graphic designers, but think about my K-12 friends out there. Think about how many future engineers, future artists, future healthcare professionals you have and you have access to, to come together and collaborate. This is why we need to break down our silos. Oddly enough, Limitless would not have occurred if those engineer students who were really nervous came and talked to the art professor who they knew nothing about what I did and I knew very little about what they did. I can't, I still can't do any aerospace engineering. I've tried, it just doesn't work out. But this was super important. And from my office today, I can look out the window and I can see the theater building. I can see the English department. I can see the library. I can, I can, if I look really hard, see the psychology building. But how many times have I gone over and just asked to collaborate? You, you find in the, in, in the academic setting, this happens very little. So what we try to do is disrupt the system, right? We tried to say, okay, I need a physical therapist. I am not qualified to put a prosthetic device on a child. I can make it look really cool. I am qualified for that, but I have no clue how that will affect their, their shoulders, affect the rest of their muscle groups. So instead of just doing it, we brought in those thinkers who, who can help and said, hey, um, OHSU uh, it, out in uh, Oregon, we asked some of the world leaders in prosthetic design to come in and help our engineering, in turn, help our art, and to create a process that is safe and healthy for our bionic kids. We bring in sociology teachers. We bring in um, marketing majors and, and major you know, PR companies. And all, ultimately, every time we've reached out, people have just said yes. And that's just because we asked. And a lot of the, the hospitals even actually said, like, you know, no one's ever asked us. They, they mentioned that they saw uh, news stories where somebody would try to tape a prosthetic device that was ill-fitting on someone. And they were so relieved when we came to them and said, hey, are you willing to help? Because they said, yeah, we're, we're here. This is what we do. Let's collaborate. Rather than, you know, only thinking that we can kind of do it all ourselves. So at Limitless, this summer alone, in a virtual slash hybrid in-person-ish experience, I am in Florida, so read into that as you will. Um, we have 35 team members of all different uh, diversities, of all different thought processes. We have different tiers of student workers. Um, we have, as you can see, all, almost, I think, nine colleges represented within our, our small operation. And all of these people help create that 3D hope and that impact. And when we build our team, we do not go for the best student. Believe it or not, we do not go for the highest performer. Um, we, when we're picking the right team, we oftentimes look for trust. And we've noticed students that we can trust and they can trust us that even our mid or sometimes even low technical skills end up being the best interns because they just need that opportunity. So this is another Simon Sinek talk. Um, if you ever watch it, the performance stress matrix, he talks a little bit at how they choose the Navy SEALs and how you know a Navy SEAL can be the best performing soldier out there. But if you don't trust them, they're never gonna be a Navy SEAL. So for us, we've kind of taken these aspects of different, um, different jobs and different skill sets and brought them to Limitless to help us build this perfect team. At that point, when we have our team, we have to foster a team culture that is sustainable, growth-oriented, innovative, compassion-driven, and student-minded. These are this, uh, the, the goals that companies like Google and, and kind of those Fortune 500 companies strive for. 
And the interesting about this is it's not necessarily team culture. It can be classroom culture as well. We should be doing these same things as educators within our design classrooms uh, as if we were doing it for a external lab that is creating things. So this is kind of what happens with that team culture. Um, in this picture alone, you have a fine artist, you have a marketing admin major, you have a mechanical engineer and a high school student all working together to paint an arm. But wait, you know, mechanical engineers don't paint the things they make. Well, sure they do. And just as my artist would help talk to them about the engineering, it's about getting these students in the same place and just having them talk and they feel safe, confident, and they have that safety net, so to speak, that they can kind of create what they need to create. So here's some more amazing interns, um, some of which have, have graduated. I think we've served upwards to 200 undergrad stu undergraduate students at Limitless over the last seven years have been a part in our, uh, in our mission uh, to create Ionics. So one of my favorite create, uh, quotes uh, about inclusive design is inclusive design doesn't mean you're designing one thing for all people. You're designing a diversity of ways to participate so everyone has a sense of belonging. Now, if I take the word inclusive design out and I put teaching, course design, curriculum design, or I replace it with any of the language for our education uh, aspect of our jobs, it's no different, is it? This is so important in the classroom to create these opportunities and to give everyone a sense of belonging. What happens is you get a really amazing team. They want to be there. You, they know they're heard. They know their diverse voices can come together to create something new and innovative. And they have the why. And all of this is so important to continually show our students that even if we were in a pandemic and all going virtual, I would have Zachary hop on a Zoom call with my interns and say, Zachary, talk about your Legos that you built today. I didn't care. I just wanted to talk to Zachary, right? Because he's my why. And all of this is so important as we move forward. And how we encourage those higher stakes come from those moments. They come from the why. And each of us have that ability to bring that into our classroom to kind of foster that. And those results, you know, a lot, there's a lot happening in my university that is cutting edge and amazing. And my, I work with some of the best colleagues in the world, but a lot of them forget to capture the why. And they forget to use graphics, design, visuals, to have that visual storytelling to empower others. And a lot of this kind of comes back to haunt us because a lot of us understand that in teaching, it's not necessarily the technical art skill that's the problem, is it? No, it's communication. It's flexibility, adaptability, social skills. These soft skills are not soft, right? <laughs> and the U.S. actually ranks relatively low in these. But we noticed that Instead of developing our students technical, most of them would get that. Most of them would get that through peer mentorship, or if I needed to teach somebody how to airbrush, I don't need to do that. I have an amazing airbrush artist who can do that. What we would help foster is their critical thinking, their collaboration, their social skills. And this just helped them blossom as learners. And by doing that, our team would be more open to recognizing when those moments, those why moments, we call them limitless moments, happen on a day-to-day -day basis. This is also done by creating meaningful mentorship opportunities, whether it's student to student, whether it was Bill and Melinda Gates, I mean, what a, what a great opportunity for some, for us and our students, or it's just us working with Urbana kids, that was important. And we took that kind of idea of mentorship and we started asking others, to help. Adobe, we simply asked and they, they were on board. And we found a lot of these companies like Ubisoft and the, the 343 who create the Halo video games or um, Stratasys, which is the 3D printer company we use. They, we, we simply said, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And we shared some of the moments and in turn, they were exposed to some of their own moments from collaborating. And it became more than the product. It became more than you know, Stratasys is amazing. They offer some great 3D printers, but they're not giving us the 3D printers because they want this slide up. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care, right? They care about 
they're doing something and they know they're helping someone and paying it forward, just like Zach with his comic book, but maybe on a bigger scale. And we notice these Fortune 500 companies, I've gotten emails from the Adobe CEO asked, thanking us for what we're doing because his mission is, yeah, they need to sell Adobe, but it's about what people do with the product. And they see the vision of, uh, we, and we all do as design educators, of how we can change the world for the better as we go forward. So I have to show some of the cool video game arms because I'm sure there's some gamers out there in the crowd. But how cool would it be to have like the Assassin's Creed arm? Uh, there's no fancy blade on that if you play that game, so don't worry. Uh, but these moments are why. Another great moment, and there's Angel again. He's had another moment, but where we had our friend Michael uh, he was with his aunt and they, he came by the lab and his aunt saw us playing our video games, not planned, came in and Michael has cerebral palsy and they asked, would it be okay for Michael to try your video games? Now we were really nervous because he doesn't have complete control of his muscle flex, but we gave it a shot. We didn't want to, you know, make him feel bad. But when he held his arm, the way you see in this picture, that's how he talks on the phone. And, and his aunt said that gives him the best, um, flex control uh, that he can use. And that's why he holds it this way. But as soon as this little boy saw his muscle flexing, making a character jump, remember a person whose muscles don't usually do what he wants them to do. And he had that control. That's the face he made. He lit up. There was, and look at Angel's face, my student there, right? And, and, and very, you know, fitting name for Angel, by the way. <laughs> but Angel was there having fun, playing, um, you know, and this caused us to say, okay, let's start talking to other people. My friends, Keith and Malad in, uh, are wheelchair users, and we met them in Vancouver and became best of friends. And, you know, we still message each other today. And I asked them when we deal with our Project Xavier wheelchair project, I asked them things. And I'll say, what do you guys think? Or how does this fit your community? So knowing those moments and exposing ourselves to different minded individuals is so important. The Microsoft accessibility team created that great accessibility controller. Bryce and his team are absolutely amazing as well. And all of this equals ownership. My students, it's not a project they're working for, it's a project they own and they're a part of. And they are invested stakeholders in their own education and more importantly, in the positive impact that it has on others. This is the ultimate goal for any of us as educators as we move forward. So our goal is to change not only our, in our case, our buying kids' lives, but to give our students opportunities and a platform where they can change other lives as well. And one of such moment was uh, Sarah, who's now a professional PR uh, uh, individual at uh, Curly and Penn, which is a big PR firm here in Orlando. And she presented at the United Nations as an undergraduate student. And she talked about women and disability and that community. And again, we fostered that genuine moment when it was, if we're invited, oftentimes we'll say for our students, you come with us. Um, I remember giving a keynote at an Adobe event and I asked, it was an education conference. And I asked, is it okay if I co-keynote with one of my students? Because why, why hear from the old professor? Why not from the student living and breathing this amazing opportunity? So all of this, all of these connections have helped us literally expand our creative reach. We just moved, we started at a kitchen table, moved into a closet in the engineering building, moved into a slightly bigger um, uh, facility or lab near the arena at UCF. And we just moved in last week to our 6,000 square foot FDA ready lab. So we can produce more bionic arms, help more kids and expand that reach to veterans and first responders. We would not be able to do this without us asking for help, partnerships and collaboration from industry, philanthropy partners and everywhere in between. And so this is truly a group effort. There's no one individual who owns this. And that's, I think what makes it so special for me. So with that said, I did wanna leave you all with some takeaways. Hopefully, hopefully you drew some connections to your own classroom. But um, as we kind of are in a, I, I hate to use the phrase post-pandemic world, but in a very new type of learning environment as we move forward, think about some ways in your classroom where you can jumpstart this creativity. This, and, and I, there, I don't lose the humor in this slide because I've been lecturing for 45 minutes, but try to lecture less 
you know, try to keep it shorter, right? Try to keep lectures shorter and activities more abundant. Um, live lectures are great. Asynchronous, there's some value in that, but synchronous sessions are absolutely important. So use that time in a way in which, you know, it's going to benefit your students and give them their, their, their own experience. This also creates a bond with your students. I can imagine that a lot of us as teachers have bonded with our students more than ever, especially those of us who went into a hybrid or virtual environment over the past year and a half. Have your students learn from one another. What opportunities in your class beyond group work, right, do you have set up um, to kind of create this sense of peer-to-peer -peer teaching? Lisa Gottfried uh, gave an amazing talk Monday, Monday or Tuesday in the session, and she does a really great job with project-based learning and creating tiers of student um, ownership to help inspire one another. Don't rely just on one form. So if you're doing something and it's just in Photoshop or if it's just in Autodesk Maya, expand that. Have them not only write a discussion post, have them do a video, have them, um, those are also a lot fun to, more fun to grade than reading discussion posts all the time, but have them like communicate to you in the multimodal formats. And remember these 21st century skills, those soft skills that our students sometimes struggle with, are, they do require 21st century tools. So look at what your student is using on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of our students now go to like Discord and they'll use that frequently. Allow them to have that community. Allow, you know, for us, it may not be the community that we're used to, but for them, they can thrive in it. And then be active, engage our learners, um, reach out and ask. It just takes asking using Twitter, using whatever social LinkedIn is a fantastic resource and simply ask one another to join into the classrooms. And, you know, we've had former students last year alone. I had 13 UCF alumni come and speak to my senior class in experimental animation over the 17 week semester. And these students work for FX Network, Pixar on the Avatar movies. And again, that pay it forward moment is something as teachers we need to amplify. And then add time for reflection. I remember as a student, no one ever asked me, why did I give you that project? No one ever asked me after a project, after I got a grade, why was that important or why wasn't it important to you? And as teachers, we definitely in the design classroom need to think beyond just the communication of the final product but also that psychological communication, that process, that design ebb and flow, and have our students have low stakes opportunities to reflect on this type of environment. Then thinking about virtual, and this is something we did in, uh, at Limitless, we would create different types of breakout rooms. And this is uh, Mrs. Park Shine on Twitter, follow her, she's amazing. But she would create different types of breakout rooms for different types of learners. So some people wanted to chat as they work and others were like, leave me alone. <laughs> and she would create those rooms. And as I look at this, and as I transition back into the physical classroom, I'm gonna take this to the physical classroom as well. So I'm not gonna just lecture the whole session, but I'm gonna say, hey, if you want to like just hang out quietly and work, this is the corner of the classroom to go to. Hey, if you want to collaborate and do something really funky and out there, this is the corner of the classroom to, to work in as well. So I think this is a fantastic idea, not only for virtual, but to remember, even though virtual was tough this past year and a half, there could be some parallels to take back to our actual classrooms that can uh, aid the development of our curriculum. Finally, here we have Ulster's design box. A lot of people ask me, how do you start with a collaborative project where everyone has ownership? This is an amazing tool that was developed at the University of Utah by a few of my uh, uh, colleagues out there that they would use to create video games with. And they use this design box to kind of get rid of the tropes or the common, yeah, you know, we all have that, right? The common designs that everyone thinks of and and just throws away. And this starts with creating a singular problem or a question, and then listing who, the why, the audience, listing what art would better serve that and what technology you have available, and then just throwing these solutions and piecemealing them together inside of the box to create a, a solvable problem. So for us, our problem was how do we provide cost-effective bionics? Our audience or why was Alex Spring in the Iron Man video. Um, our aesthetics 
were superheroes and our technology that we had available, 3D printing. And that's how the solution came for the Limitless project uh, as we went forward. Now, we didn't know about Roger Alter's design box, but in retrospect, it really fits and it really helps and works. So this is a great activity to do either in person on a whiteboard. You can even set up a Google slide. Uh, Dan, who I think is still here, Dan did a great uh, comic book presentation at ITSE and he had everyone collaborating on Google slides. It was really wild. I don't like, I, I'm envious of that. I wanna do that for a presentation one of these days. Uh, other resources, and we know this from teaching design, but have your students sketch and please, those of you who are in K-12, make it clear that you don't have to be an artist to be a creative. Everyone can do this. Um, my 72-year-old mother, who is an English teacher, can pick up a pencil and doodle. And the human brain does process imagery 60,000 times faster than text. So a combination of both is the best thing to do. This is a great way to ideate, get out ideas, get out the, the common ideas, and give your students a failure, it's failure, it's almost failure friendly environment to, to create and develop and, and build different, um, different innovative ideas. And, and they're going to, they're going to discover uh, uh, unexpected things as they go. Some of the tools I use frequently, obviously Adobe Suite. I love Adobe Capture, Adobe Spark for K-12 community. I've learned so much, by the way, from the K-12 community which is kind of funny because if you think about it, we, we're disjointed too, right? Though we play a huge role in what each other does. Um, I started listening to the problem solving that K-12 was going through with virtual learning. And that's where I found tons of people on Twitter that would really help. Um, so definitely check out K-12 Art Chat uh, at the creativity uh, uh, department. They're an amazing uh, married couple who actually, I, I crashed the art chat every Thursday. I'll, when I can't, when I'm not falling asleep from having a two-year-old, um, but I crashed the heart chat and uh, they're really welcoming. I love Adobe Portfolio, um, just some amazing resources. And LinkedIn is so important. I know sometimes it, it's, it's not the coolest of social medias, but definitely allows us to connect with one another as we move forward. I'm going to provide these slides. Actually, if somebody, uh, if one of the moderators has the link and they want to paste it in the, in the chat uh, for everyone, because I don't expect to do this. But these are amazing humans that I know. I can't fit all the amazing humans I know. That would be my whole 50, uh, 50 slide PowerPoint. But uh, obviously, Victor Davila, Tacey Trovich from Adobe, Tanya Averett, Tim Needles, Jen Williams, Adobe, Mala Sherman is amazing if you don't call her, Jackie and Dan. Um, Clara, the Bionic Kid is Zachary. Definitely follow him. He's a cool kid. Um, that K-12 art chat. And then Abby with her Design Together podcast. These are just a handful of people that inspire me and, and really amplify the limitless voice, but also take their student voice and amplify it uh, to the world and give them that platform that is is so imperative, especially for those of us who teach in underserved communities or teach underrepresented individuals, um, continue to do what you do with that. Some great books and resources, Steam Power by Tim Needles, uh, Teaching Boldly by Jen Williams. These are amazing books that kind of take that understanding of the power of moments and talk about how to go into your classroom. So if you're higher education, even if you're not teaching Steam, these are really great resources to get takeaways to bring to your design classroom. Great other books, um, Lean In, especially uh, Women Work uh, and The Will to Lead is absolutely amazing. Whatever gender you identify with, it's still really important to uh, be able to kind of lean in and, and embrace your ideas and not let them be pushed back. Extreme Ownership talks about how they feed the Navy SEALs. Um, I particularly from that book, understood that I have a aspect called decentralized command with my students, which means I'm kind of in the background, not hovering. And when they need me, I'm there, but I like to have them kind of set their, their standards of learning. Uh, so amazing, amazing opportunities uh, for us as designers, whether you deal with disability or not, to kind of, uh, uh, you know, push that. And I end every slideshow with the following slides because it's so important in my teaching and my design and the limitless practice that we encourage collaboration. We break down any silo in our place. If somebody's going to tell you no, that's fine. I get told no a lot, but don't let it impede you for your future success. We need to be proactive. 
Um, we can't be spiteful and we, you know, it, there's no time for that, especially in our world today. Um, let's, 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 you know, win them over with proactivity. That's not really a word, but I'll go with it. And then empower each other through creativity. And the final slide I want you to remember, because we are in a challenging time and we are in kind of a weird um, rethinking of education is it's not impossible. It just hasn't been done yet. And I can't stress that enough. You're going to be told no. You may think your ideas are silly. You may think, oh, why would we 3D print an arm for a child? You asked me 20 years ago, I would not know that existed. But I want all of you to kind of look for those moments, look for those opportunities. When a path becomes available to you, take it. And it's okay to take it and fail, right? It's okay to try something in our classroom and it not work out, but it still can be a vast learning experience for you and your students. And so, you know, we get in the habit of doing things that have just always been done, don't we? as educators. It's the same curriculum. It's the same, oh, the person before me taught it that way. Well, disrupting the system is what you have to do to change. You have to take different ideas. You have to think outside yourself and be open to those ideas and try. And so we have an amazing, the AIGA community as a whole has been an amazing opportunity for designers to get together. And I think it's, you know, maybe our mission as designers to start reaching out to other communities outside the design world and share not only the amazing stuff you all are doing as designers and educators, but also share and amplify what they're doing and how design and creativity can help that. So I'd like to thank you. This has been amazing sharing our mission and uh, please follow Limitless at Limitless 3D. It, it's, um, it, you know, it's life-changing for me as an educator um, it, it made me rethink disability, design, uh, visual communication, and everywhere in between, and I'm truly passionate about that. But we really appreciate the time today, and I guess we have some time for questions. Um, I went on my, my rant there, so I'm sorry, Alberto. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, uh, for everybody in the chat, uh, I forgot to introduce uh, earlier this morning, I got so excited because Victor and you were here. Uh, but Tamara McLean has yes, been serving Tamara. as our community moderator today. Um, she was looking at the chat. She probably has a few questions for you, Matt. I'm going to ask if you could stop the screen share so that we can all, you know, gallery yeah. view. We can feel like a community. Hey. And every everybody, if you want to speak, uh, this is a session that will welcome that. Just use the raise hand feature, and we can start taking your questions also in turn. Tamara, take faces. it away. <laughs> All right, um, we did have one question that came up in the chat along the way and I copied it later. Um, were you using MakerBot machines for the arms? So we started question. with uh, some, some MakerBots. We've kind of used a lot. Um, and then we uh, had the fortunate uh, opportunity to partnership with Stratasys 3D, which um, our 3D printers look like refrigerators now. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of those of you who know, like Make MakerBot's a great brand, like we, we don't discriminate on 3D printers, but uh, Stratasys has been uh, really helpful for us in providing us uh, eight to 10 of those giant printers. So typically that arm, when we put it in the printer, all the pieces and the painting will take anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to kind of get everything out in a perfect day with all the interns, but um, we can kind of output those. And we've started recently taking our 3D prints and, and uh, using more uh, thermoforming, if, if you know what that is, um, just to make the arm lighter. And we've started uh, kind of, that also helps our ability to mass produce things. So that's what we're thinking about for the FDA. Our first clinical trials will, the results will be taken to the FDA after we have about a hundred kids in the trial. And we're gonna present this data to them, hopefully, the outcome will be insurance companies are like, you know what, this 3D printing stuff is, is okay. You know, we'll, we'll take it there. So it is a little bit uh, interesting how the 3D printing, we started just 3D printing, right? Like a big block of arm. And we slowly started to innovate even that process. So the arm in, you know, two years from now may look completely different, but 3D printing will always be an aspect of that. About how many arms do you produce a year? Yeah, so, so far, um, when we first started this, uh, when, it, when it was that kind of student project, um, 
they wanted to produce thousands, right? And the practicality behind that is it's, it's just, that's not, that may not happen. <laughs> There's a, you know, once we started involving healthcare individuals as we should have um, and, and hospital partners, we definitely decided to slow down. And so we've helped over 40 kids so far. And we are, again, doing the first clinical trial in the United States for 3D printed prosthetics. And that will continue until we gather that data for the FDA. Because our, our goal, and there are companies out there who do really cool 3D printed prosthetics still, and they do them really well. I think in our industry, competition is great. Like more people get help. But we want to make sure that our goal of whether a kid gets a limitless prosthetic or not, that it's affordable to the families. And so doing the FDA route slowed things down, but it also is done very purposefully that the result of these trials hopefully should say, okay, now arms are covered like glasses, arms are covered like other de uh, de assistive devices. Does anyone else have any uh, questions, uh, comments? I, I have a few questions and I can do this all day. So I'm just gonna keep them to two. Um, at the rate that you're going, when does 3D printing stops because of the way that the process, and you know, an injection molding comes or something like that. And I had a second question about perception. And I'm, I'm really curious as to, has any kid requested an arm that was not decorated? Like, is there anybody yeah. who, who felt that that was still being too alien? Um, you know, so. Yeah, um, so we do use injection molding. We actually use injection molding for the finger parts. Um, uh, the tips of the fingers as well are molded uh, gripped rubber. Lack of, I'm not the engineer, so I'm going to just like say the wrong thing and they'll yell at me later. Um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, we are currently using injection molding, thermoforming, and other facets. So the 3D printing is always going to be there for the to help us at least build, whether it's those molds, we create bucks that like are used in the thermoform to kind of help give us like the, the, you know, the speed that we need to create them. Um, as for the coloration of the arms, we created, and this was a couple, you know, this is well before we started the clinical trial, we were thinking about how, we, I, I'm not a fan of the boy arms and girl arms, and I'm gonna put my air quotes up. I, I don't care what colors the kids pick, and I, I, they can pick any design they want because it's them, it's theirs, and I'm all for it. Um, so what we started with was we started with a few empowerment classes. So we have one that's called Warrior, that's the tough, looking arms. We have one that's serenity, which is really mellow and chill. Shadow, which is mysterious and ethereal, which is kind of a lack of a better way to say it, the bougie arms, the fancy arms. Um, you wear them to uh, a big fancy events, right? Um, and we categorize those, those arms. And we, I, I remember talking to Merdula Pedenti, our uh, branding director, who's amazing as well. And I said, well, how, how can we get the kids involved in this? And I remember at that time I was playing soccer and I designed my shoe on Nike.com and I brought it back to her and I said, can we, again, this is always me going, can we do this? And I had no clue how to do any of this. I was like, can we build that for the arms? And she's like, she's a web design graduate and everything. She's like, I think so. So we went to our computer scientist and we actually built the Nike version of an arm designer. So the kids can choose their own colors and they choose any color in the rainbow. We get a ticket, we print it, we paint it. We do all sorts of fun stuff, but we did have a kid. Um, we, we haven't had any child choose skin tone yet of their own skin tone, which is really interesting. Um, but we did have a child paint one all yellow. And it, it was the Arbiter arm, which is a anti-hero from Halo. I guess. Um, my, my game students are going to get mad at me if they see this. Um, and it, we called the, the child and said, hey, are you sure? Was this an accident? Did you want it all yellow? But he, we noticed that he wanted it to look like the Infinity Gauntlet. Even though that wasn't the shape, their imagination went to the Infinity Gauntlet. And so, yeah, he painted it all one color. It was like, you want like different shades of yellow? He's like, no, not just gold. It's all gold. And we're like, all right, do you want it like super shiny? And he was like, yeah, just the, just the gold yellow. And we're like, okay. And then that was fine. So we have had moments like that. Um, another really cool one is Zachary's arm, where is, uh, it's like red, white, yellow. And 
I asked him, uh, I thought it was maybe like the Blash he was trying to get across, like the character. And he said, no, it's Shazam. The bottom sleeve is all red because it's like the cape. And the, the top, the, the yellow is like the lightning bolt. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So like the stories behind the colors they choose, to, when we meet them before the pandemic, when they would come in in person for checkups, we would uh, ask them immediately, like, why do you pick these colors? Because for us as designers and artists, it just fascinates us because I don't have that imagination anymore. I can't like hone that eight-year-old's eye, right? To go like, wow, this is really cool. So yeah, so far um, they can essentially, to answer your question in more detail though, they can essentially choose any colors they want. Um, so if it were to be a skin tone color, that's fine. Um, we would just definitely want to make sure that we're obviously matching that to their, to their liking. Perfect. Um, have you had any, Alberto, did you have another question? No. In addition? Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to pose? All right. Terry, Terry. go ahead. Hi, Terry. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've got a couple of questions and I'll keep them really quick. Um, first, can they wear those prosthetic arms outside in the rain? Yeah. So they, I, I don't suggest them jumping into a pool. <laughs> oh, that was my second question. Can yeah. they swim with them? Um, something we've definitely thought about the, the more questions we get when the kids get their bionic state you know, having the clinical trial reveals some things like we, we have kids who, you know, want to take a kickboxing class and we're like, oh, I, weren't, I wasn't realized you're were going to punch anything with that arm, but that makes sense. Um, so for the rain, it can get wet like your device, um, like your cellular device. It, it's uh, not exactly what I would call waterproof. ABS plastic does absorb a little bit. So we have to be careful. So we don't suggest it's immersed, but if they needed to walk from point A to point B, I, they could wear their arm. It would be fine. It just would be a matter of like, if you're in a downpour, you probably would want to cover it with something. Yeah. I have one more question or one more statement. So um, I have five fingers and then I have no fingers on my right hand. Okay. So I was crying through the whole thing that your whole presentation, because I grew up in the seventies and eighties and this was not available, you know, just the hook, you know, mm -hmm. like, Captain Hook, and I never wanted to do that, but I also never wanted to not be me. Yeah. You know, I didn't want an extension of me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted people to accept me. Yeah. But the way that you're talking, I was like, damn, where, where was this when I was growing up? You know, so I really appreciate what you're doing. So, and thank you. Yeah, I, I can't stress enough that you know, th there's a lot of companies out there that may lean heavily on, they need this, they need this. Ultimately, that's not our decision at Limitless. Um, we're there to provide a service if, if they need it and if they want to use it. I know a lot of our, our kids, we've he heard from the kids as they've gotten older, um, they may wear it for a week or two and then not, and then put it in a drawer. And then their parents may hear a couple months later, hey, where's my arm? And so, you know, it it's, it's important that, you know, especially with the Bionic Kid comic book, and that's why Victor and I really dived into that. It was important to know that the arm does not define them. That arm is, it's just, you know, it is a thing they wear, like their glasses. Um, it doesn't, it, that is not, they are complete, they are amazing, and they are whole. And our culture has taken the idea of disability and either try to erase it or make it a bad word and, um, you know, for us, it, that's not the case. We're just trying to, you know, serve is the best way to say it. You know, serve for, serve those to hopefully empower others. Excellent. Does anyone else have any questions? Have you considered moving um, the prod products to other limbs or other parts of the body? So we, we've definitely, we've had some conversations on how to expand it. Legs actually, as I mentioned, you can get um, a little easier with insurance. So we, we, I believe the guys did print a leg at some point and then went up, oh, like these are hopefully affordable at that point. 
Um, when it comes to uh, limb difference, and, and like, as Terry mentioned, there's many different types of limb difference. So our current limb difference range is kind of mid forearm to upper, um, you can't be all the way to the shoulder because that our design would be ill-fitting, right? So as we get that FDA approval, I imagine, and I would like this, uh, if, you know, all the engineers are listening, <laughs> but as we get that approval for our device, then we can kind of expand it to, you know, whether it's a hand device, whether it is a hand only, finger only, um, and, and kind of start exploring those other solutions uh, with that. So that's a great point. We want to make sure we do the one thing very well because it's so important because if our device is ill-fitting or um, we want to make sure there's no long-term effects by wearing a prosthetic of a certain weight, we try to match the weight of the actual other person's uh, fully developed limb. Uh, all of that is really important. So yeah, it's a great question, but I, I imagine as we move forward, that is the case, especially when dealing with first responders and veterans uh, and adult uh, limb difference as well. And so, you know, it's important. That's why I guess our population starts really small. You know, you start small and then you have that big impact, right? Like that's, that's our goal. And, you know, within the next, every couple of years that that's kind of expanded for us. So we're looking forward to the next few years. Terrific. Thanks. Um, I don't have any other questions. Alberto, do you want to take over? Sure. Uh, Matt, there was an image with the kid running the bike. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering about that. Uh, how, how do they get to that point? Uh, do they train with you? Like, like, do they, like, do they have it in their, like, they've been using it for a while and they come back and they said, Oh my God, I ran a bike. And you were like, Oh shit, I didn't know you could do that. And, and then you yeah. guys go back in and look in like how the, how does that developmental process and risk taking go along? It's, it's, it's every kid is different, right? Every child, we have the risk taking kids who like, we've had kids who jumped into pools without like us thinking to say, Oh, don't jump in the pool. Like they're like, Hey, I got a biotic arm Ooh, right in. And we're like, well, we're fixing that arm immediately. Right. Um, <laughs> The Alex with the but Alex with the Iron Man arm riding the bike, he had already had a few iterations of the early version that you saw on the kitchen table of that arm. So he was a little more confident to do that. Um, I've had, you know, we have comedic moments where a kid will be there with his cousin. He gets his arm, he makes the fist, immediately punches his cousin. Like <laughs> what they'll do with it is kind of part of our trial. We want to see the limits that they'll take it to. Um, and, you know, luckily it's just a piece of plastic that breaks. Now, typically that plastic is, if done well, as strong as a human bone. So when they do break these things, it's a little like, as a father, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, okay, like if that's their actual bone, that would have broken. Um, we've had kids jump on trampolines with them. Like I said, go into pools. We have had them ride bikes. I think it's just, it's up to every kid. Um, some of the kids just wear them while at school. And that may be the only time they wear them and that's okay. Um, at, you know, our ultimate goal is that you can play a piano with them and, and do some amazing things. Uh, th there's a, another factor that I don't really talk about, but I also feel that these prosthetics should be fun. So yes, riding your bike is cool, but we actually developed a, I'm gonna call it a dart blaster because I don't have the sponsorship I want yet, but a foam, there's a famous brand of foam dart blasters that kids play with. You can probably guess the Nerf name, um, but if they're <laughs> listening, uh, but like we created that with the flex too. So they can actually take their hand and replace it with a little like dart blaster and, and have fun with one another. So we're looking out like beyond just, it's just about having fun and empowering it. And, you know, the video game controller kind of taught us that because their friends would come in and say, well, I have to use the regular controller and the, the bionic kids would say, yeah, this is my controller. This is made for me. You, you can't touch this. And then they'd play each other in the video games. And of course the flex controller, the bionic kid would wipe the floor with their friends. So um, yeah, I, I think those moments of fun are not overlooked and what other kind of cool, you know, fun moments can we create from those? It's, honestly, like we have like, like, brain trust, brainstorm moments all the time with that, just to see, you know, with our bionic kids, what, what they're looking to have. But yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, the Enter the Dragon reference where the guy, the evil guy would change off the prosthetic, uh, yes. you know, the, the thing. So that, that's also an opportunity, you know, right now, Kids want to, you know, they want to look the same and the hook is not the best reference, but what if there could be add-ons that actually gave them an edge uh, sure. in certain activities? And I bet that some kids would want that. And, and that's up to that individual that. too, because the interesting part about that is some of our kids will say, absolutely. Like let's, you know, if it was a functional form function kind of aspect, and then other individuals will say, I don't need that. I'm okay. Yeah. I can do that with my, my other arm or my limb difference. Um, and so, you know, we don't, obviously we won't force it on them or anything like that. It's just there for them if they want to explore with it. Um, that's absolutely fine, but yeah. And the, and, and the, the prosthetic itself, you know, there, there sometimes is, you know, there could be value for certain people with hooks or, or any type of other device. Um, you know, there's value for arms that are mechanical versus manual operated. Some of the arms they, you know, that are out there, you can just turn and, you know, it just kind of, it doesn't need to have like really cool Luke Skywalker mechanics behind it. So we, we think about all those things as we design and it really helps us kind of that ebb and flow of our design process as we develop the next thing that uh, Lego arms, think about that, right? You can actually build your sleeve with Legos. That's something I wanted to do for a while as well. So that's a presentation in itself, like a brainstorm <laughs> workshop of how to design cool prosthetics for, for fun. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Matt, then we wanna thank you for thank having you, joined us. Um, don't misinterpret the silence for lack of engagement. We'll send you the chat because it was on fire I'm while a, you were I'm presenting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the <laughs> chat was on fire while you were presenting with amazing reactions uh, and engagement. Uh, and thank you for sharing. And I think that uh, this sets a great tone for the day because you know, after a whole week of session after session after session, suddenly, you know, to be reminded of the why we did everything that we did this week and everybody yeah. who's in the session doing their thing, um, it's incredible. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, for the rest of you in the session, we have w one official session left before the closing ceremony. Um, uh, we wanna uh, remind you the mentorship, helping students succeed beyond the classroom with an amazing task is coming up at 1 p.m. Please, uh, you have to, well, not, you don't necessarily have to, uh, but if you wanna be the good student, you have to uh, be the video on YouTube. You have time between now and when the session starts so that you can see it and join the conversation with George Garastegui, Dory Tonstall, uh, Nita Vima, and Saraya Cameron. Uh, so on behalf of the DEC, thank you so much for being here and we hope to see you in one hour, uh, no, an hour and a half. Thank you and so thank much. you, Matt, and thank you, Tamara, for, for all your hard work as moderator. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Bye.